you all went now because we're going to be on the plane for three and a half hours. And then you get on the plane and there's some, um, there was like a, um, you know, a cooler with some cold drinks and they put it down between the seats and they said, well, here's a cooler and nobody ever touches the stuff until like you're just about to land. And it used to be that when you landed, you could go to the bathroom before you went around and got cleared. Well, they've changed that now and now you have to go and get cleared. And every time I go down there, I've been going down there since 2005, the rules are different. I mean, something has changed about the place. Um, but just getting there, and it's expensive to get there, unless you're in the military. Um, the visits generally have to be planned 20 days in advance. You have to tell them, you have to make, for the habeas clients, clients who are not in front of a military commission, you have to make all of your travel reservations, tell them this is where I'm going, now you've bought your tickets, and then they will come back and tell you whether your visit's been approved, which again makes it difficult, and at the last minute they can say the military cannot accommodate you on this date, and then you're out. Um, the flights are limited. Um, for me to go there from New Mexico to visit with my client for a day or two really takes a week by the time I get there and get back. There, I don't, you all probably are, are not primarily lawyers, you probably don't deal with clients in jail, but generally clients in jail can call their lawyers. Um, they can call their family. Um, they can make phone calls. These people cannot. They, they have, if my client needs to speak with me, if there's an emergency, he might be able to get word out to me through someone that he needs to talk to me. And then I can try to set up a meeting, a phone call. This is the habeas client, not the client who has top secret clearance, but the other one. And I might be able to arrange a phone call I'm supposed to uh, ask for 10 days later. And it's very, very difficult to communicate. And then we can't talk about anything classified. Um, we'll have a minder on the phone. Um, so, you know, they can't, they can't talk, they, their families can't visit them. No one visits them except their lawyers, or the guards or interrogators, um, or an occasional doctor, but they have no other visitors. And that in itself leads to a lot of mental stress for people who've been locked up for a long time. Um, they're usually shackled to the floor when you're talking to them, um, which again is unnerving. I find it unnerving to be talking to someone who's shackled to the floor, and it's of course difficult for them. Um, to be in a room where they're shackled. They have big, big metal bars and circle, these circle things that they hook the shackles onto in every, every visiting room. You take notes, they have to remain in the secure room. If I take notes when I'm meeting with my client, then they have to go through a process, and then again, I have to come to Washington to read them. I can't take my notes back home. Now, this isn't just the Guantanamo problem. This is a problem with any case that has classified evidence, but it's made more difficult when it's so far away, it's so hard to communicate, and you can't bring them back. I've had other cases with classified evidence where the room where I keep my secure notes is in the same city where I happen to be, either where I'm trying a case or where I live, but the only secure rooms here are in Washington or Guantanamo which makes it very, very difficult to keep track of whatever it is you're doing. And of course, there's evidence that I have that I can't share with the client. And that's very troubling as a lawyer. You need to share things with your client, but the client isn't entitled to read the classified evidence. So there's certain things I can't tell my client, things I can't show him. So this is... Um, Abrahim El Nasri, uh, you may have read about him. This is the first death penalty case. Um, it's being litigated now. You can actually go online to mc.mil and read the, the transcripts. Um, I have a few, few clips here. And look at the pleadings. They're coming out pretty quickly online. Um, he is a Yemeni Saudi man. He's been incarcerated since 2002. Um, he was in the black sites. The government has admitted 
that he was waterboarded. Um, the government has admitted that um, some other torture uh, of him, although they haven't admitted that it's torture. That's my words. So what are the issues? Well, there's no statute of limitations. The statute of limitations is a huge protection for criminal defendants. It means that um, they can't go back and charge you with something that happened many, many years ago when all the evidence is difficult to get and it's hard to defend yourself. And that's almost every crime has a statute of limitations except murder um, in the United States in our criminal justice system. But there's no statute of limitations in the military commission. And I'm going to show you how that makes a difference. Of course, the discovery is classified. We've talked about that. Um, there are blacked out years, places, events. There are things that we don't know. There are things the government won't tell us about. Um, where was he from 2002 till he went to Guantanamo in 2006? What happened to him there? Um, what kind of interrogation was there? <clears throat> there are videotapes that the government has admitted it destroyed intentionally of his interrogations um, and the interrogations of someone else. Um, nobody's being prosecuted for this, by the way. Um, but there were videotapes. We don't have them. And, you know, it's very difficult. This is a death penalty case. In death penalty cases, normally we have um, what's called mitigation, certainly in other cases too, but it's very important in a death penalty case to go back and look at the family, look at how he was raised, who was he, where did he go to school. Um, of course, it's very, very difficult to do that when you're doing it in Yemen or Saudi Arabia, um, which is and most of these people are from countries where it's difficult to do this kind of mitigation at this point. Um, I have been to Yemen. Um, I have not been to Saudi Arabia, but I can assure you that the mitigation is difficult and expensive, and um, you know it's going to be important. We want to save this man's life. So he had a first hearing, and this was his first appearance in court after nine years. Nine years of incarceration, all of a sudden he's in this big courtroom, and the, the courtroom in Guantanamo is, um, it's a portable courtroom, so, like, there are no bathrooms, um, which I, I realize is, like, when you're sitting there all day long, it's kind of nice to have a bathroom instead of having to go out and go to the little porta potty on the outside. But it also, it has the places for the lawyers and the defendants to sit, and then it has a big glass area in the back for um, visitors, family members, press, and there's an alternate site too where they can program stuff. And then there's somebody who can push a button if there's something classified that they don't want others to hear. So he came in, he'd been in solitary confinement for many, many years. Um, and I mentioned the waterboarding. The government has also admitted that at one point while he was hooded, which is blindfolded, um, a uh, drill was turned on his head, by his head, and a gun bullet was chambered in a gun. The noise that is, when a bullet is chambered, that tsh noise, um, and his family was threatened. That has been admitted. Um, you can imagine the effect that might have on somebody after he's already been incarcerated for many years. That's the picture that the court reporter took of him. Um, listening to his first hearing after nine years with American lawyers. He has military counsel and civilian counsel. So there was a motion, and um, the motion that his lawyers filed was for the commission. The, the, judge, the commission is really the judge, and they, sometimes he's referred to as the military judge, sometimes he's referred to as the military commission. And the motion was to order the government to indicate what would happen if he were to be acquitted. What's going to happen to him? Well, let's say he's found not guilty. Does he get out? Um, and the military judge asked this question. If the accused were acquitted today, there's no legal prohibition from the government to take him under the authorization of use of military force straight back to the cell he came from? And the um, prosecutor said, that's absolutely correct. So he, let's assume that the 
members of the jury, the, the members, the military members, find that he's not guilty of the charges. He's charged with being the person who orchestrated the blowing up of the USS Cole in October of 2000, plus some other charges. Let's say they find him not guilty. You would think he would get out of Guantanamo, but it does not appear to be the case. Um, the second motion, this was a motion to bar the uh, JTF as a joint task force, Gitmo as a shorthand for Guantanamo personnel from violating the attorney-client privilege by reading attorney-client information. They had decided uh, that they were just um, going to go in and, and kind of scan the mail. They weren't really reading it. They were scanning it. And they were deciding that this is not the judge, but the prison authorities, what he could have and what he couldn't. Um, the government, uh, and this transcript is public, it's um, it's the un, uh, unauthorized. I mean, it's the authorized public transcript. It's on the website, and that's where this came from. This quote that these quotes came from the website that anybody can get to. The government made a, a claim that scanning mail isn't the same as reading it, and you know it's a mystery to me. Does that mean you read every other word? I don't know, but you know they clearly were reading documents that. Um, were between lawyers and clients. And this fundamental, it's fundamental that lawyers and their clients get to have confidential conversations. So the judge then asked this question. Included in the definition of contraband, this is from the prison, is correspondence related to any ongoing or completed military intelligence, security, law enforcement operation, investigation, or results? Isn't that what this case is about, he says, um, since this case is about the investigation of um, the USS Cole, which was, uh, had a hole blown in it and 17 sailors were killed. And um, the commander at um, Guantanamo said, yes, that is what this case is about. And so the judge says, well, under that definition, they couldn't write to their client about his own case. Um, now, to some extent, this has now been mitigated. The judge has signed an order saying that uh, attorney-client mail cannot be read. And um, if anybody has a question about it, they now are under his control and not Commander Welsh's control, and they'll have to come to him, which is a help for the Nashri case. But, I mean, this is an example of it just inconceivable to me that the government could argue with a straight face that they can scan the mail, but they're not really reading it. So trial issues. Uh, this is the first death penalty case to be tried in Guantanamo. Um, coerced testimony may be admissible. In the United States courts, it's fundamental that if testimony is coerced, it's not reliable. And we don't want to convict people on evidence that's not reliable because when you torture someone or coerce them or threaten them, they kind of say anything. Well, it may be admissible um, against the accused in these cases, depending on how the judges rule. Hearsay is admissible. Also fundamental to American criminal justice is that we believe in the right to confrontation. Now, this isn't true in all systems of justice. But it is true in ours, and it's been said by the U.S. Supreme Court that the greatest legal engine to finding the truth is to confront your accusers. And, um, you know, uh, that's fundamental. Fundamental. We don't trust hearsay evidence in this country, and yet in this court it's admissible. This client's accused of attacking a U.S. destroyer and of murdering sailors. All the jurors will be military officers, and many of them may be naval officers. And of course, this was a Navy ship. And then the rules keep changing. Um, some new rules came out right while counsel were flying on their way there. And um, does anybody know the, the uh, concept of a kangaroo court? <laughs> Well, there's my kangaroo, uh, for those of you to whom that <laughs> means anything. But literally, the, the rules keep changing, so you never know from one day to the next what the rules are. So there are also a couple actions in Europe. Um, 
In Poland, um, our client, the Al Nasri, has been declared a victim, and there's a petition uh, that was granted to declare him a victim in the investigation of whether there was a black site in Poland. And the European Court of Human Rights um, Council have sought a order demanding that the government of Poland use all means to ensure that he is not subjected to the death penalty. That motion is pending in the European Court of Human Rights on his behalf. So then there are post-trial issues. As we said, even if he wins a case, he won't be released. Now, what will happen? What will happen, let's say he wins, is their position is, the government's position is, well, he can file a motion for a petition for a writ of habeas corpus and go to the court and say he should be released that way. So then he starts that. So that leads us to my client, Mohamedou Ol Salahi. This is a picture that the, um, the uh, Red Cross took of him and sent home. He's been there since 2002. And he's seeking his release through habeas corpus. Uh, again, the law keeps changing. After 10 years, we won Mohamedou's case. Judge Robertson said he should be released immediately. There is, the government can't meet the slightest burden. This is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. This is what's called a preponderance of the evidence. Just barely tipped the scales. They couldn't even do that. 10 years, um, we had a hearing. The judge said they don't have evidence against him. The government appealed, and the D.C. Circuit Court said, well, after he wrote that opinion, we kind of changed the law. So now go back under our new version um, and see whether you, whether he still wins his habeas. And so we're back starting all over again um, with him. He was also tortured. Um, the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld had specific um, rules for two prisoners in Guantanamo, a man named al Qatani and Mohamedou al Salahi. Um, and the government has agreed not to use any of his statements from that period of time since um, he was kept from sleeping for about 70 days. They've admitted all this. This all c came out in a Senate report, the Senate Armed Services Committee report. So this is all public. Um, he was taken out in a boat. He was beaten. His ribs were broken. And um, he was told he was going to some other place where no one would ever find him. He received a fake letter from the White House saying, we've arrested your mother and we're bringing her to Guantanamo. How do you think she'll fare here with all these men? There's horrible things that they did to him. Um, <clears throat> we have a limited right to discovery, even though we have security clearances. We get documents that are heavily redacted, um, blacked out, that we don't know where they came from or what they are. The government is really, in his case, is using fear. They originally charged him with the Millennium bombing, then, then they couldn't hold that, then they charged him with 9-11, then they charged him with being a part of Al-Qaeda. They just kind of keep changing and they keep telling the judge this is a dangerous man. They have no evidence of that and there is no evidence of that. Um, so, but let's say he wins. Let's say he wins his habeas case. And, you know, we, we already won once. Let's say we win the second time. And the government appeals, and we win all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court says he's to be released. Well, he can't be released into the U.S. Congress has already said that. So what happens next? He goes to the military commission. And the circle starts all over again, because remember I said at the beginning there's no statute of limitations. So now, let's say he wins three or four years from now, and we finally get to the Supreme Court. Then they say, well, We'll just charge him with um, material support, which ought not to be a war crime, and that's a whole other story. But we'll charge him with material support to terrorism and put him in the um, military commission, and the whole thing will start over. So um, this last slide um, is, a, is a quote from Justice Rutledge in a case, Yamashita, who was a Japanese um, general who was tried by the US for war crimes. And the quote, I think, from 1946, which is before most of the people in this room were born, except for a few of us. Um, 
but it's really important. Um, it is not too early. It is never too early for the nation steadfastly to follow its great constitutional traditions, none older or more universally protective against unbridled power than due process of law and the trial and punishment of men, that is of all men, whether citizens, aliens, alien enemies, or alien belligerents. It can become too late. So I leave you with this question of whether it has become too late. And that was a good many years ago, and we're still there. So, uh, any questions that you all have? Yes, sir. Yes, um, Mike, uh, Frank Fletcher. My question is about the changing rules. The military commission, um, there's a law, legislation passed by Congress. Who is responsible for making the rules with respect, I guess, then the legislation is comprehensive enough? Well, the legislation, the, the rules have changed. The military commission, there was a 2006 version, now there's a 2009 version. Uh, but then there are rules that come out. The Secretary of Defense has rules, as you saw the, uh, the prison um, has rules. Um, various rulemaking is done, some by the Secretary of Defense and some by the prison. And then, of course, the, there will be court precedent as we go along. But it just seems like all of a sudden they started reading the mail. I mean, that this had not been a problem for years. As the, the habeas council, we've, we've had a system, our mail has been protected, and then all of a sudden the commander of the, of the prison said, well, we're going to go in and gather up all the mail. That's what I mean. In that connection, um, isn't there a prohibition in U.S. law? I believe it's absolute. I mean, I did serve in the military, and, um, even under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's called ex post facto laws. You can't say, well, we've changed a rule and you did something that breaks the new rule, but you did it before the, the change to right. the CMJ happened. Good luck with that. You know, I mean, the AUMF went into effect mm -hmm. after all these alleged crimes. Um, take the coal as an example. That was in October of 2000. We were not at war at that time, for example. Um, you know, what right is there now to say that that was a war crime? These are, these are problems. This is not the, the same as the military code of justice. It just isn't. That's a good, that's a, you know, a good body of law, but that's not what this is. Well, they could be tried, could have being tried under the Uniform Code of Military Some of them could have been, um, but all of them could be tried in the U.S. federal courts. You know, <clears throat> there have been 93 terrorism cases tried in New York City alone since 2001, and there have been 400 in the country. The, the f these people could be tried in federal court if they have the evidence under American law. The problem is if they don't have the evidence that is sufficient under our criminal justice system, they create a court where they're more likely to be able to convict because everything is stacked against the defendant. You had a question? Yeah, I guess this is a question you get every time you speak, but uh, it, this is really outrageous. But uh, ordinary people, what, what can people do? Like, is, is Amnesty International, have, have they adopted any of these people, or are there other support groups, or what, what sort of things do you recommend? You know, it, it's really hard to know. It's very frustrating. Yes, Amnesty's been very involved. Amnesty has written a great deal about Mohamedou, and you can find it on their website, Mohamedou al Salahi. Um, they, uh, Amnesty, um, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights First, they found a lot of the airplanes that flew people to in and out of places to the black sites. Um, they've done a lot of research. Um, they are trying, you know, writing amicus briefs. They're trying to um, assist in every way they can. The International Red Cross uh, sees people, um, gets them so that they can have family visits on Skype. There have been a couple of family visits on Skype, and that's helped the prisoners. I mean, it helps their mental health. Um, but, you know, people need to get out there and say, we want this closed. We want, our, we want our justice system back. We've lost it. We want it back. And people need to demand that of people in power. Uh, Mrs. Holman, would you comment on the motivations behind these damn Yankee government officials? They swear an oath, all of them, to 
defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, yet here they are trashing the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Well, I, I, I don't know what to say. You know, they, they've also identified people who um, have committed the crime of torture. Torture is a crime. There is a crime of torture in the United States Code. And uh, near as I can tell, nobody's being prosecuted for that. Um, you know, I, I mean, I tell them all the time they're trashing the Constitution. It doesn't seem to get me anywhere. Yes, sir. Um, so I just wonder, is there any way to get past sovereign immunity at some point down the line and try and, you know, hold some people accountable? Well, many of these people are not governed by sovereign immunity. That's not the issue. The issue is simply that they're not being prosecuted. Um, it's not, I don't think it's a sovereign immunity issue. If you know the person who strung my client up and turned a drill on, or the person who um, <clears throat> violated the Geneva Conventions and said, we're going to send, threaten your family, that's a violation of the Geneva Convention. So, um, and, you know, the Geneva Conventions treaties are a part of our law. Those of you who aren't law, lawyers, um, we have the law that says you can't run a red light, and we have a law that says you can't mistreat prisoners. One is a statute and one's a treaty, but they're both laws and that the government is bound to uphold um, and that they simply could be prosecuted. These folks are not immune. That It's just a matter of choosing, as the president said, to go forward instead of backward. When, when you hear these things about the Guantanamo, would it be more humane to shoot these people and finish when this is a common thing? Question I have for you, who pays your uh, couples of expenses, who pays your fees? Um, for my uh, Mohamedou, um, nobody. I mean, that is to say my law firm and I, we've, we've simply taken this case on. Uh, and we did it, um, fortunately he speaks English, so I didn't have to pay for an interpreter, uh, which would have been hugely expensive, but we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in time and expenses. Lately, over the past year or so, the American Civil Liberties Union has joined in that case and are assisting us with some of the um, expenses of experts and doing some of the legal writing. Um, the other one, there were the ACLU had a project called the John Adams Project, where um, it agreed to pay minimum amounts for, um, for them, and the rest of it is simply pro bono because it needs to be done. Uh, the military is now paying some of the fees for those who are being prosecuted by the military. I mean, they, they provide military counsel, and they're paying, for in the death penalty cases, they're paying for what's known as learned counsel, which is someone learned in the death penalty, which is required under the statute. So they've hired, uh, the military has hired those people, uh, learned counsel for El Nasri and for some of the other people that it plans to try to kill. So what will happen to the government if they shoot them and finish with them? I mean, instead of torturing them and keeping them and creating all this bad thing about America in the Middle East, because it has been used in the Middle East. I mean, people hate America because of Guantanamo, I can tell you that. Why would not shoot them and finish with them? Well, I think they, uh, I mean, you know, I, uh, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I don't think shooting people is the answer. Um, and it certainly won't make us any friends in the Middle East um, to do that. The answer is to close Guantanamo and give people legitimate trials and those who um, we can't convict because we don't have the evidence should be released. I mean, just like we do with everyone else in this country. Yes? Um, what is your Well, there's no provision in the law for administrative detention until we just recently passed it. Um, it goes really against everything that in our criminal justice system that you can just de detain people indefinitely. <clears throat> you know, how many other countries do this and the United States has up in arms all the time. Um, how horrible that China's detaining people. How horrible 
that Russia is detaining people, how horrible that some other country is detaining people. We want them to have rights. Some American gets, gets captured somewhere, and the United States is just insistent that people have a right to be tried. It is fundamental and part of our United States Constitution that you have a right to a trial um, before you get locked up. We can't, we can't just detain people because we feel like it. And that's essentially what we're doing. Yes, ma'am. Um, firstly, Ms. Hollander, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I was wondering, as a student who is thinking about going into international human rights law, um, maybe I missed this because I walked in a little bit late, um, if you could share a little bit about your own experience and how one actually gets into such cases and takes them on. Um, and yeah, just a little bit about your experience. Well, you know, I guess everybody comes at this differently. Um, I, I don't really know exactly how I started doing this. I did a lot of teaching. Um, I taught a program in Russia in the early 90s uh, about jury trials. I taught a, for the UN in Vietnam. Um, and I got involved in the International Criminal Court training lawyers. I've just done a lot of training. And as a result of that, I met people from around the world. That's how I got involved with um, Guantanamo through that and through the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I think it's just a matter of going out there and finding people, getting involved. You can get, you can get on the list of lawyers for the International Criminal Court. You can uh, get on the list of lawyers, um, perhaps, for some of the other international courts. Um, and you can take courses um, from various people who will also hook you up. Um, I had a student several years ago in Geneva who helped me write a, an intervention I was doing on rendition at the UN, and she was a student of international law, and her professor brought her to Geneva, and now she's working in Geneva. Um, you know, she started out as a student in San Diego, and she went to Geneva, and. Um, went to a nonprofit and then went to another nonprofit and now is working there. I think you just have to get out and do it. There's any number of avenues for it. Yes. Um, Marilyn, how often does the ICRC come to visit the prisoners? And also, are you worried that there are prisoners being detained places that we still don't know about? Um, I don't know how often the ICRC comes. I've seen their trailers. Down there, I do know that they, they have a pretty good presence. And with the prisoners who um, are not the, the most, as far as the US is concerned, serious, they are helping them get letters to their families. Uh, they check on them uh, pretty regularly. I mean, they have somebody down there. I don't know how often. You know, the ICRC is very quiet about what it does. It doesn't um, issue reports to anyone except the government uh, or the detaining government, and it just kind of does what it does. So I don't know how often they go. I've had my clients tell me, you know, that they've had a visit from the ICRC, so I know they're down there. As to your second question, yes, I'm very concerned. Um, <clears throat> I had this discussion with someone just recently. I have every, you know, I, I, let's put it this way. I have every reason to be concerned that there are other prisons that we don't know anything about. Um, I don't have evidence of that. Um, I just think that we don't necessarily know. Um, assuming that we will not close down one time on like the prisoners here, seeing as Americans don't even want them to be tried in this country, right. do, you, what, do you have any suggestions of a, of a better alternative? Well, you know, we could have real trials in Guantanamo. They just need to be real trials. They need to be resourced. The defense needs to have all the resources that the prosecution has, which it doesn't have. The defense needs money from the government, just like when we have indigent clients in the US, they either get public defenders. I'm talking about federal cases now. Um, they get public defenders, or they get lawyers appointed. And then they get resources. They get consultants. They get experts. They get translators. Um, it's, it's like pulling teeth to get this down there. And of course, the habeas clients, the government, um, except for a few public defenders, they're all being represented pro bono. And we should have real trials. There's, there's, 
you know, real trials. If there are really war crimes, then try them in military courts, but real courts. That's the answer. We have a justice system. It works. Most of the <clears throat> people charged with terrorism have been convicted. Very few people charged with terrorism in this country have walked out of court. And, you know, there have been 500 of them. I mean, it, why, why can't we do that? The majority of these there are, yes, we know there are people in Afghanistan, right? But, but far more than even mm -hmm. time now. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the procedures there, do you have any familiarity with that? I don't. There are people who know what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, I've tried to represent those people, but I don't know much about that. Yes, sir. I don't think, you know, the big question I have is why, it, why is it happening? So because Basically, Guantanamo represents like a, a negation of uh, all the principle, the basic principle that uh, base the United States as a society, as a country, as a state. It's like human right gone, uh, the right pros the um, the right to a um, good process right is gone. The rule of law is gone. So why? Well, you know, I, I, I can only look at the history. When Guantanamo started, the U.S. Um, was in this fear frenzy after 9-11 and um, started picking people up and decided to put them somewhere where they thought they would never, nobody would know where they were and they would never have lawyers. And that was the intent, that they were going to be there without lawyers um, and they were just going to be there. It was a detention, it was an interrogation facility, not a detention facility, really. Let's get them in and interrogate them. And then um, it just, you know, lawyers found out about it, families found out about it, and the Supreme Court said you can't do it. But the intent, initial intent, was just to lock people up forever. Um, in total violation of U.S. law, and then they started kind of trying to write laws to justify it. Um, it's a, it's just an abomination. That's all you can say. Yes. Hi, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm from New Zealand, so I, you know, and I work with Fred Wilson on a project, and we're unfortunately um, all these um, uh, things you just said, but uh, the perception certainly amongst some lawyers, some senior lawyers outside the U.S., is that much of the blame for this. Well, the Supreme Court's been pretty strident. Everything that the administration tried to do, the Supreme Court said you can't do it. It said people, um, the, originally, the idea was that the Geneva Conventions didn't apply. Well, the Geneva Conventions apply to everyone. They're, they're, they don't just apply to the military. They apply to combatants, non-combatants. There's everyone fits somewhere in the Geneva Conventions. And the Supreme Court said, um, you can't deny, uh, that's where common article three, which is that you can't basically torture people. Um, and these people have a right to that. Then the administration said, well, they don't have a right to lawyers. And the Supreme Court said they have a right to petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Then the administration said, well, they have a right to petition, but they don't have a right to actually get it. Uh, I mean, that's the mystery to me. But that was the government's position. Well, they, yeah, they can petition, but they can't get any remedy. Then the Supreme Court said, no, they get a remedy. They really get real habeas. You can't just ignore it. So the Supreme Court has come out um, pretty well. Now, it has not taken every case. Um, it turned down some that I wish it had taken. And of course, isn't as strident as perhaps I would be. But without the Supreme Court, um, we'd still have a Guantanamo without a single lawyer. And um, nobody would have ever gotten out unless just by fiat, which is actually how most of them did get out. The lower courts have now begun to make a mockery of the Supreme Court. Yes, ma'am. Um,
what changed him and, and what can we do to change him back? Uh, you know, he signed an executive order saying it would be closed um, and has blamed its lack of closing on Congress. And to some extent, that's true, um, the difficulties in Congress. But it's, you know, it's up to people and, and represented um, representatives to say, we want it closed. It, it's as simple as that. We want it closed. We want these people tried. Try them there in real courts or try them in America or release them. Treat these people like everyone else in America. I mean, don't forget, the Constitution applies to everyone in this country, not just citizens, not just legal aliens. An illegal alien, somebody who walks across the border is completely illegal and gets charged with a crime, gets the same trial as an American citizen under the Constitution and under the laws of this country. And yet we have created a prison of only foreigners. Um, who didn't even want to come here. Then let me, is there someone else who hasn't spoken, hasn't asked a question? Go ahead. Um, could you say a few words about um, compare and contrast with the, I read the familiar with Northern Ireland and the British laws there and what you think of, are they violating their constitution? Or In Northern Ireland? Well, what, what do you I'm nearly... They have a lot of this administrative they do. A lot of countries have, they don't have so much as they used to. Um, I was involved in a case in Ireland, um, a terrorism case, um, <clears throat> but it was a case where it was a court you know, with judges and a trial. Now, you know, there, there may have been issues in that trial that I didn't agree with, but he was charged in a court. Um, they don't have jury trials, but uh, many of the other countries don't have jury trials. That doesn't necessarily mean their trials are unfair. Um, but getting off on the English in Ireland is a, is a whole different story. I mean, a lot of countries have administrative detention. Um, it is something we've never approved of in this country. We've just simply never approved of it until now. I heard a couple of years ago of a judge that sort of resigned on principle. Have you seen evidence of military judges and Yes, um, the chief prosecutor, uh, Colonel Morris Davis, resigned and has been very vocal since then. Um, you can read his op-ed pieces and various things that he's written. Um, there are several other prosecutors um, <clears throat> who have resigned um, or who have testified for the defense. I'll tell you um, about one um, because he's one that I know, um, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Couch um, was sent down to la prosecute Muhammad Udo Salahi, the young man you saw the picture of in the hat. And this was in about 2004. And um, Colonel Couch is a very religious man and a Marine. And he uh, had a friend, a very good friend, who was one of the pilots who died um, in one of the planes. I believe that was one that went into the Pentagon. And when he was offered the job of prosecuting, this was all in a Wall Street Journal article. This is where it first came out. Uh, he was offered the job of prosecuting Mr. Salahi, who at that time the government was accusing, they keep changing what he's accused of, but at that time he was accused of um, recruiting pilots for 9-11. So Colonel Couch goes down to Guantanamo and he's all, you know, I'm going to get this guy and I'm going to, set up this case and we're going to prosecute him, we're going to give him the death penalty. And he goes down and he's in, and he's a very kind of straight dude, you know. And he hears this loud music and pro, I don't know, has anyone here ever heard the, the, the group Drowning Pool? It's um, probably not, but um, the kids have. It's, um, they have a song called Let the Bodies Hit the Floor and it's just hard rock heavy metal song. And he hears this song and, you know, this loud blaring and he thinks, what is this some young soldier doesn't realize that this is just not appropriate here, you know, we're trying to get some work done. So he goes in to look for it and he's about, I mean, he's ready to like, 
take this young enlisted man that he's sure he's going to find and, you know, teach him a thing or two and be a real colonel. And this is how he describes this story. And he goes marching off and he finds a cell. And in the cell is a prisoner curled up in a corner in a fetal position. This music blaring, strobe lights going on and off. And this guy curled up and he stands there. And this young soldier comes up to him and he says, Sir, please, you're not supposed to be here. And Colonel Couch says, What the hell's going on here? What is going on here? And he says, Please, sir, you're really not supposed to be here. And he says, Well, I'm here and this is wrong. How much of this is going on here? Um, <clears throat> and he, of course, finds out that more of it's going on. Then he starts looking into Mohamedou's interrogation logs and he realizes that he's been tortured. And I mean, he's been, uh, you know, the things that I mentioned, he was taken out on this boat and his ribs were broken and he was deprived of sleep for 70 days and various other things. And he's really disturbed by this. And he says he went to see someone else, a Marine, and he said, what do I do? And the other officer said, you do your duty, you're a soldier. And he said, but my duty is to defend the Constitution, defend the Geneva Conventions, defend the Convention Against Torture. This is how I was trained as a military man. That's my duty. And then he went to a sermon. I said he's a very religious man. Um, and he goes to a sermon, and his pastor says, gives a talk about how every human being has human dignity, and every human being must be treated with dignity. And he goes back to Guantanamo, and he takes this file, and he says, you get some real evidence after oh, on this guy? Call me back. But I'm not going to prosecute a case that's based on coerced interrogations and not treating someone with human dignity, and that's not what I signed up for in the military. And he walked away from that case. Um, he prosecuted some others. He's now an immigration judge. Um, but he, um, I mean, that's the best story. There's others. Um, uh, Vandervelde, who ended up testifying on behalf of Jawad. There are two other prosecutors who quit. Um, it's uh, the, I don't know of any judges who have quit, but a number, there's probably about six prosecutors who have just walked away. Um, because it's, you know, and, and Colonel Davis will say the same thing, that the military is bound to defend the law. That's why people, that's what people are told in the military. These are our laws and we defend them. And um, so they've had to reach out and find others who are willing to violate them, frankly. Any other questions? We've run out of questions. Thank you all for your interest in Guantanamo. It is depressing. You know, I always, people, I, I, I give various lectures and one student came up to me from, I was giving a lecture about something about this nature and he came up to me, he said, can't you give us any hope? <laughs> and you know, I, I mean, I, I, I hate to give a talk that ends with so little hope, but I've never figured out a way to talk about Guantanamo that's hopeful. I just, I just can't. I mean, I desperately want to get my clients out. I want to see all these men get out. Um, this is, you know, it's destroyed our reputation in the Middle East. It's destroyed our reputation. I travel a great deal, and I travel in the Middle East. Um, and I mean, people are always very kind to me. I've never had a personal problem with anyone or anyone in Europe. But, you know, when, when you say you're an American, they say, how can you guys do this? How can you do this? We've looked up to the US all these years. We believed that you were one of the good countries. And, you know, we're not. We're just not anymore. We need to take back our justice system. We need to take it back. And only the people can do that.